Hello and welcome everybody to the July meeting of the Berlin Epidemiological Methods Colloquium. My name is Torbu Glatz from the Institute of Public Health at Charité and together with Jess Roman, Tobias Kurt, Chisato Ito and Hannah Grumeyer, we host these talks always on the first Wednesday of the month. We also have a journal club on the third Wednesday of the month and you can go out, check our homepage bamcolloquium.com if you want to find out more about the schedule of the next uh, couple of months. We have a few experts on the panel here with us today, and we will introduce them after the talk. If uh, during the talk you have any questions, you can use the Q&A function and um, yeah, then have a lively discussion afterwards. And you can also indicate if you want to ask this person in question so that we can un unmute you so that you can ask it yourself. But now I have the pleasure to introduce our guest and welcome Sabine Ertelt Prigion, who is Professor of Sex and Gender Sensitive Medicine at Radboud University Kennel Medical Center in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. And she's also at the Faculty of Medicine at Bielefeld University in Germany. She will tell us about current methodological challenges in the study of sex and gender in health research. And without further ado, I hand it over to you, Sabine. All right, thank you very much for the invitation. You hear me? because I think I, I muted myself before I wasn't yes. sure I was supposed to be muted. All right, uh, well, thank you very much for, for the invitation and the introduction. And I'm, I'm very happy to, to be able to share these things with you. I, would, I was hoping to come to Berlin, but you know, it was not possible. So I hope we will have another opportunity for, for an exchange in person. But nevertheless, uh, it also gives me the opportunity to talk to you from here in the Netherlands uh, in real time. So. I called it current methodological challenges, but I think we might actually start with some more general points on what is it actually that we measure when we measure sex in, in biomedicine and what is it that we try to measure when we measure gender and how are we dealing with that overall. And I will give you quite a few resources and some pointers on reporting what is needed, what is not needed and, and where you can find help if you want to do that. Um, I'm happy to share my slides afterwards, so I will, I will make them available for everybody who, who needs them or wants to, to have them after the talk. And then I'll move over to some of the challenges, which are a little bit more specific, so um, we'll see in how far they resonate with most of you. So I don't know how, how specific in terms of methodology most of your talks are. I will give you quite a few of conceptual points to think about today, and I hope that will give us the opportunity also to address some of these in the discussion. Um, as said before, feel free to ask questions. If anything is not immediately clear, they will let me know. So I'm happy to address any questions that come up while I talk. And then for the more general questions, more, let's say things that are more in principle or, or uh, longer to address, we, we could possibly move that to the discussion. And I hope that's, that's all right with all of you. I don't see you reacting, but I just assume you'll be agreeing on that. All right. So let's start with uh, the conceptualization of sex, which should be in principle quite easy, right? In most of our questionnaires, we have like two boxes or three, depending, or four, depending if you want to give people the opportunity to not answer or not address. But in most cases, we just assume that it's quite easy to do. However, if we do think about it theoretically, there's really at least three layers of, of how we can measure sex. So the first one is, is genetics. And uh, if you think back at how, how we studied this in, in biology in school or later on in university, we, we just learned that there's basically two sex chromosomes, XX and XY, female and male organisms. And that's pretty much how dichotomous the world is supposed to be. And so if, if you think about it and you never really have to work in the field, that's, that's just the way we, we divide it. And we assume that there is really a 50-50 kind of equal division. However, if you look at, at the statistics, that might not be completely true. And of course, we also have exceptions in more rare cases where we have X0 or XXY or XXXY uh, people, which we don't really, unless you study rare genetic diseases, we don't really include that much and we don't really even conceptualize that much in our work. So in most basic biomedical research, we just assume that there is a dichotomy with XX and XY. So that's the first layer we can be looking at, which is genetics. The second way we can operationalize sex is by looking at hormones. And here it already becomes a little bit more complex because the first question you'd be asking is really what kind of hormones do you want to measure? 
And if we think about how we define those, we, we traditionally call them sex hormones, just assuming that, you know, estrogens are female sex hormones and testosterone is male uh, and androgens are male uh, sex hormones. And if we think about the, the reality of what we're, we're actually seeing and what we know by now, yes, they are more abundant in female or male organisms, but really uh, most of these hormones are produced by everybody in the population. We kind of made some arbitrary divisions of, of what is male and female uh, and use that as cutoffs for the work we do. You can measure hormones in different tissues, so you can measure it in blood, you can measure it in saliva. And, and of course, one of the questions you, you might often get um, is why should I measure hormones at all if, if I'm actually not working, for example, on the menstrual cycle or if I'm not doing something that is strictly related to the hormones? Well, even if you don't uh, look at something that's strictly related to the menstrual cycle, for example, what you see here on the right hand side is really how our immune cells change and adapt in their responses throughout the menstrual cycle. So depending on which phase a premenopausal female is in, and that is goes uh, for, for all uh, uh, organisms that stop menstruating eventually, um, in the follicular phase with high estrogens, you'll see that you have more of a Th2 cell response. And in the luteal phase, you'll have more of a Th1 response, which means that really depending on when blood is collected and when you do these analyses, you might actually record different types of immune responses based on what moment of the cycle the blood has been taken. And if you don't take that into consideration, you might actually see differences that might not necessarily be relevant in any way or form, but you cannot explain them simply because you did not measure that correlation. So what that means is we don't necessarily need these hormonal levels in, in all the studies we do, but it is really something to keep in mind because the effects of the hormones go way beyond just something that's related to reproduction or to the menstrual cycle per se. They do have much more systemic effects that could influence actually what you're studying. The third level that we are addressing, I see that there's a lot of chat questions. I would love to actually get rid of this, but unfortunately I can't. So if there's anything, if there's anything that matters directly, let me know. Otherwise we keep them for later. The, the fourth level, the, th the third level we can use to, to measure uh, sex and actually to define sex, and that's possibly the way most of us have been categorized as female and male, is actually looking at external genitalia. And that's what happens to most of us when we're born, we're a baby, people look at us and say, okay, based on your genitals, you are either female or male. Now, by now, we know that there's a lot of variance in, in this um, level. And that means that depending on the statistics you look at, you can have anywhere between zero to zero seven to up to 2% of people actually identifying either as intersex or being categorized anywhere on a spectrum of people with differences of sex development. And that can be anywhere, uh, including these symptoms. And in most cases, what happens if you are defined as intersex or as a person with DSD, at birth, it just means that your genitalia cannot clearly be categorized in either female or male. Now, that means that we really have three layers, genetics, gonads, and genitalia. So three Gs, we, we tend to call them. And if you think about it from, from a research perspective, what we usually use to define sex and when we ask people is of all these concepts, probably the least precise. So the way that people are attributed to one or the other sex is usually at birth with one of the levels that is least known. I think most of us have no idea about the genetics. Um, a lot of us have no idea, definitely no idea about our actual state of hormones, and it's only usually measured in, in specific cases. So if we think about this conceptually and, and what that means for our studies, even for sex, which of the two concepts of sex and gender, are, talk about gender now, um, is the easier one to measure, or at least the one where people assume it's easier to measure. Even here, we don't have all the, let's say, certainties that we would assume we could have. Now, 
If you want to look for resources in the last two years, uh, together with many other experts and under the direction of Landa Schiebinger in a Klinge, we have worked in, uh, an EU expert group and have updated the gendered innovations website. So if any one of you is looking for resources is looking for information and case studies, I would point you to, to this website where we have also placed together all the information you might possibly need at different levels of the research cycles so or from identifying the problem up to analysis and dissemination and there's many cases and example on how to do that so this will give you also clear pointers and you can look at depending on where you are in the cycle what are the best options you can use to analyze and report um, sex in your research when it comes to what we would like to see, um, well, first of all, what we're missing in a lot of studies is even having an idea of the rationale. So we, we look at, at studies in detail and, and what we find is that a lot of times looking at the reporting sex differences might be an afterthought. So people did a lot of analysis. The only thing that came up were sex differences and somehow the paper seems to be adapted retroactively to the fact that this could have been a point. So it would be nice to actually see that in the rationale. The second point is it seems really simple, uh, but it is not. In many studies, we still don't know, especially when they involve cells and animals, what kind of sex these cells and animals had. With the animals, we know sometimes. With the cells, many times the researchers themselves don't know. So it would be quite helpful to actually know that and take that into consideration. If you're doing basic research and that doesn't apply to you, that's why I didn't go into detail. I'm, I'm happy to share some resources for whoever that, that could be helpful. Um, there's other confounders you might want to take into account, and that's a lot of things having to do with these animals, the housing conditions, what they're eating, how much light and darkness they're exposed to, who's the experimenter. So all these factors can play a role. What we would like to see is an analysis by sex, which which frequently doesn't happen. And even if it happens, a lot of times it's not reported. So the main point to take home is really, it would be wonderful if data were available, disaggregated by sex, and ideally if an analysis could be sex disaggregated and reported. I know this sounds simple, it's not. It's simply not what we're finding and we're not finding this in large trials and we're not finding this in small trials. So that's why I have to repeat this. And then of course, let us know what that means. So once you have found any difference, or maybe you didn't, so also that would be nice to know, uh, let us know what that actually means for, for the research field you're working in. So, so much for sex, which is the easy part. Let's move on to, to gender, and it becomes a little bit more complicated. Now, I'll say, I'll, I'll start a bit with the terminology to kind of place you in this realm of, of gender, because historically, um, what we have heard is sex is the biological part and gender is the social cultural part and it's really nice because in Germany you usually get like soziokulturelles Geschlecht and people just wonder well what does that mean and especially if you meet if you work in uh, a field in a biomedical field where you need to measure things quantitatively it's extremely difficult to find a way to measure soziokulturelles Geschlecht because what wh where do you even start which kind of crosses do people have to place on their questionnaires so in the last years, what, what we have seen is um, the, the attempts to kind of split the, the concept of gender, which is really a multi-layered uh, concept. And it's actually more of a doing than a being, but kind of seeing that broken down into different layers and different dimensions that can be addressed. So the minimal levels that can be taken into consideration here are either identity which means really who you are. So how do I identify? Do I identify as a man, as a woman, as a non-binary person? And what you see here, you can have a congruence with your sex at birth. So, you know, you can be XX and identify as a woman, but you might also as well identify as a man or as a non-binary person. So there is per se not a direct correlate between the two. And importantly enough, if you want to know people's identity, the only way you can really get to know that is by asking them. So that's the one thing where you will not have any idea or cannot really make any assumption unless you ask people directly, which also seems quite simple. But, you know, if you work in the biomedical field, you can ask yourself how often that really happens. The second layer 
is roles. So this is really what is expected of us. So how are we supposed to be and behave as women, as men, as non-binary or queer individuals, as trans people in a certain society in a certain time? So what does that mean? What, what is expected of you in terms of behaviors, in terms of expression? Uh, who can you be? And, and what happens if you don't conform to that, for example? So this is really, I would say, the, the vision from outside, while this was more of your subjective perception of, of who you are. And relationships is really, to say in very simple terms, when these two things come together. So when your own perception is met with the perception through another person in a social context, what does that mean in terms of how, how different things are negotiated? So that can be in the private, that can be in the professional, and that can be in the public space. So for example, if you are in a relationship with any other person, who is going to work? Who stays home when the kids are sick? Who actually makes more money? Who has decisional power? The same thing goes for relationships at work and of course care relations. So what is expected of you? If you have to negotiate your salary, does it actually matter if you, what kind of person you are? Do you have different leverage? Uh, what kind of power do you have? And then at the layer of really of society in terms of gender relationships, it's also a question of legislature. So for example, sexual and reproductive rights, how is that regulated at the level of society and what kind of power is given to individuals in this? So relationships is really when you encounter, when you as a person encounter others in, in any different form. Institutional gender is um, what is expected of you within an organization. So for example, if you work uh, in a company or if you work in, 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 an, in a university, what is a professor supposed to look like? Well, how are they supposed to act? And what happens if you don't conform to these things? So how do you personally deal with that? But what, what kind of expectations does your organization place on you? And what kind of burden can that be or not? And how, which kind of liberties do you have? So these are different layers. I will not address this one because it's, it's more of a specific thing, but I'll address these three. And the question is, well, how, how can we do that? How do we do that? When it comes to gender identity, it, it is the more direct one, or I don't want to say the most simple one, because still choosing which kind of gender identities to ask for is an interesting question. But nevertheless, what you will find in quite a few uh, statutory um, research um, questionnaires that are being used, and, and for example, also in, in several um, US surveys like NHANES and so forth, they're actually using a two-step approach. And what happens here is you're being asked which was your sex assigned at birth. And, and here we go one step back to what we talked about before. So female, male, intersex, sex not listed here, prefer not to respond. And then you ask people what their current gender identity is. And here you can give them a number of options and that will be a bit up to you. There's quite good resources on which kind of options you can possibly be giving and how you do that in a gender inclusive and respectful way. Um, so there is quite some literature on that. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to share some of those afterwards. The basics, of course, that you should be having as women, women, men, non-binary, gender queer, already here, not everybody falls under that umbrella. You can give people the opportunity to, to choose a gender if they want to. And then, of course, you should have prefer not to respond. What you need to take into consideration here is, of course, the statistics of that all, because what do you do if you have like 2000 people and three or five tell some gender that you don't know how to categorize uh, and that you then eventually put together with these other forms. So it is also a bit of a, a methodological question in how far do you want to be inclusive in how far will that will that allow for statistics that actually make sense and can say something uh, or do you need for example to oversample some populations in order to make to include them and so you need to put some thought into which of these categories will actually be filled in and how do you deal with that nevertheless the two steps approach is finding more and more use uh, and you will probably encounter it in, in some statutory uh, surveys as well. We have some questions about if and when it might be used in Germany in some questionnaires. 
uh, there are some thoughts about at least um, using some of these questions. Let's move on to the gender roles. So what I'm showing you is probably historically the most used questionnaire for gender roles, which is Sandra Bam's uh, sex role inventory. So, or the BAM sex role inventory, whenever you, you are successful enough, it gets your name. It has been used probably a hundred times in biomedicine. It was developed in the seventies in Berkeley. And what Sandra Bam actually set out to do, she, she went to college students. Um, that's the way most of these surveys have been developed, the early uh, gender surveys and ask them to actually place masculine and feminine attitudes in a box. So tell me what the typical feminine and masculine attitudes are. So the first time I saw this, I thought, oh my God, what kind of construct is this? And how can anybody actually think about still using that in the year 2000, whatever? Um, it is just a super stereotypical representation of things that don't apply to me. Well, then I started reading about this and it turns out that yes, some of these thoughts are true and I still believe some of those, but nevertheless, it actually has quite some merit, which is connected to the history of it. So in, in the time when Sandra Bam developed the BMSRI, um, the assumption was that femininity and masculinity were actually two opposite poles on one line. So we were assuming there was one dimension and at that dimension, at one extreme, we had masculinity and at the other extreme, we had femininity. So what Sandra Bem and a few of her colleagues did for the first time was actually breaking up the idea that there is one dimension with masculinity and femininity at the poles and actually say there's at least two. So you have actually one dimension of femininity, which goes from zero to a hundred, if you want, and one dimension of masculinity, which goes from zero to a hundred and people can just allocate themselves on both of these at the same time. So you can be, I don't know, 80% feminine and 80% masculine at the same time, or 20% and 50% and so forth. So what she did actually with that was kind of break up the idea that we can only allocate ourselves somewhere in a, in a specific point, which is mutually exclusive and, and came to separate the dimensions of masculinity and femininity from what we would now call gender identity. So if I'm a woman, I don't necessarily have to score high on feminine items. I can score high on masculine items and low on feminine items. So it is completely separated from, from each other and actually ends up giving you four categories, masculine, feminine, indifferentiated, which is people scoring low on both and um, androgynous, which are people scoring high on both. So it was in itself kind of revolutionary because it separated, first of all, the identity from the role, and it gave us the opportunity to think about these different dimensions. There are a lot of other examples of gender role questionnaires. I'm not going to go in the details of these, but for whoever is interested, there's a lot on masculinity and femininity separately. So this is one for masculinity. And the question here is what happens how do you deal with conforming or not conforming to expected masculinity? The same thing exists for femininity and how that leads to potential psychological trouble in one way or another. Um, these questionnaires have been used less and less. You see there was really a wave of development of these in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s, because we were grappling with these new concepts of what does it actually mean to be feminine or masculine? Um, and so we have a lot of these questionnaires, which are really not used that much anymore, but, but there's a whole history to them. When it comes to gender relations, it becomes a little bit more tricky. There's less questionnaires available on gender relations. Um, I would say probably because it's, it's complex to define gender relation. It's also difficult to extrapolate gender relations from many other contextual factors, because as I said before, these happen within at least a relationship between two people, but they can also happen in the workplace or within larger societies. So how do you actually extrapolate this? Nevertheless, there, there are a few attempts and I show you one of them. And there's, there's one point I'd, I'd like to make about the gender relations questionnaire. So most of the gender relations questionnaire that address uh, partnerships um, tend to address equal distribution of tasks. So they usually ask about who makes more money who takes care of the kids and who goes to work in different layers and, and uh, different formats. So that's kind of the, the dimensions that are being addressed. And that goes for uh, homosexual couples, heterosexual couples. Um, actually, it's, it's unrelated necessarily to, to sexual orientation. 
Interestingly enough, if you look at these, it's always important to kind of have at least two measures because there's a huge social desirability bias in these. And especially if you live in a country that places high value on equitable distribution of roles, you will have most people in a relationship saying, yes, of course, we have really equal distribution of tasks and very equal roles. But then if you ask them, okay, but who, how many hours are you spending on housework? And if your kid is sick, who's going to stay home of the two of you and so forth, you might actually find quite different uh, answers or you would allocate them in a different way. So if you want to set out to measure this, uh, and as you can see, self-perceived and, and self-reported is actually the numbers don't match very well. And so if you want to set out to measure this, I would advise to at least ask people about hours or time or something that's quantifiable. And then you can still ask them about their opinions because they might diverge. Now, moving on, what is happening now is um, we have seen that there are several layers to the concept of gender. And as I showed you just now, there, there are several instruments and I only showed you a few examples. There's many that you could pick from, which of course makes it complicated. So assuming that a clinician or, or an epidemiologist want to study this in a clinical study or in, in an epidemiological and observational study, you want to know which kind of questionnaires to use. And so uh, for, for a very long time, we didn't really have questionnaires bringing different dimensions together. And then in 2014, Luis Pilote in Canada started with developing the gender index, which I'm showing you briefly. And then with that, she started a whole new wave of people trying to look at how can we bring these dimensions together. So if you look at this, what you see, these are actually the seven dimensions that are included. And here you see a lot of these gender relations questions. So the income, the hours of work spent doing housework. Um, this is actually a tricky one. So this is anxiety, what's mostly being measured. And here you see the BSRI, which I showed you before. Um, the idea here is that you measure gender roles and you measure gender relations and so forth, and you measure them together. So the good thing is, of course, that for any person approaching this without uh, having made this their main field of study, you can use one index and, and use that for your work. On the other hand, what you get as an answer, if you do this, is the probability between zero and 100% to be a woman. So you kind of get a score of, I don't know, 80 uh, or zero, which would be 100% men. Uh, and then what do you do with that? So of course you can use that and, and classify people in your study and say, okay, the higher the gender index is, the more this happens, you know, the more, the higher the risk for, in this case, they use it for cardiovascular disease recurrence, but what does it really mean? And if I think about this as a clinician, I would like to know which of these dimensions actually plays a major role so that I can address it. So although it has the advantage of bringing different layers together, it also brings us a kind of a step back because what I told you initially was that Sandra Bam in the 70s revolutionized the idea of having two poles. So from going from masculinity to femininity to actually having two layers. Um, and the other thing is when it comes to actionable um, answers in a way, this index might be tricky. And this applies to most of the indices that have been developed uh, based on this kind of in the same way which might also be related to the fact that many times the outcomes that are then used to model these are binary sex, which is probably an issue in itself. But, you know, we're not going to go into the details of this. So let's say it's definitely a step forward in having one instrument, but it has several methodological challenges attached to it. Again, if you want to look more in detail of what it means to analyze gender, which different layers you can be looking at, which kind of questions you could be asking, I would again point you back to the Gendered Innovations website, which we have updated, where you can find uh, a lot more detail and more resources to go into the depths of, of uh, the different moments of the research process. When it comes to reporting gender, um, several things are the same when, when it comes to reporting sex, but one essential difference is really this one what kind of concept of gender are you working with? And I think here really the question that you need to ask yourself is if you want to measure this, which kind of layers of the gender concept are actually important for my work and which kind of questionnaire do I plan to use based on which theoretical framework? So it is really 
not so much we're measuring the you know social cultural gender but it is really which kind of aspect is important in your work or what do you actually measure when you measure gender and and which kind of outcomes will you have here so are you measuring identity are you measuring roles are you measuring relationships and, and which of those might actually play a role then again of course we would like to see breakdowns by gender uh, consider in this case if you need to apply an intersectional lens in many cases uh, when it comes to questions of gender, they're really questions of power uh, and accessibility and, and um, representation attached to this. And so the question is, is gender really the only dimension you want to be looking at or do you actually need to integrate that with other dimensions? Uh, so like race and sex and, and class and religion and, you know, many other layers that might actually play a role in what you're doing. And of course, again, please report in a disaggregated manner so that even if you cannot do, you do not have enough um, statistical power to actually do your analysis, you will still be able to make this available to others who then maybe in a meta-analysis can use your data. And of course, let us know what it means. Now, how do you deal with reporting this? I would point you to the SAGER guidelines, um, which have been published five, several years ago um again these are not absolutely perfect they could be further developed but overall it's probably the best framework that applies to to most research that is not specific just to the field of sex and gender but really general um, and how to report sex and gender what you will find in the paper is two levels so one is really for authors so what should you be reporting in the different sections of your paper and what should we be looking for so what you report in the title and the introduction and the methods and so forth. The second layer is the SAGER guideline for editors. So not a lot of people are using this, but more and more journals are embracing this uh, and among them quite some bigger journals. And so here the question is really for the editors to kind of do a, a simple screening if basic data about sex and or gender, depending on what's being researched, are being made available. So it might not be relevant. If it is, you know, has uh, data been reported in a disaggregated manner? Is the, has the design considered it? And is it considered in the discussion in the limitations? And then if it's not available, maybe, you know, either address that or ask authors to address it. So this might be a good resource when it comes to asking yourself, what should I report and what not? Now, a few challenges, because of course it's not easy. Um, the first one is really, what happens in real life. So I already addressed a few of these, but just to bring it together, I really advise you have a look at this really good review that came out in the gender issue of The Lancet two years ago. So The Lancet published in February of 2019, that gender issue where they addressed all kinds of different layers. They made a, a very strong commitment to placing a lot more attention on sex and gender in the way um, they're gonna, uh, well, what they're gonna ask for when papers are being submitted, but also in the way they want to work. So it's like different, different things they address. Anyway, what you see here is that there is an interaction between sex and gender. So we have here, that's the baby with the genes and the genitalia and the uh, hormones and the gonads, the three G's. So this baby is born and we could um, potentially just address sex. However, the reality is that any human being is born into a system that is constituted of family relations, a community where you live in, institutions that play a role there, and structures and policies. And within all of these layers, you do have norms, expectations, and power. So while you grew up, you are exposed to different layers that impose gendered expectations on you. While growing up, the other thing that happens is there are different levels, and that's the intersectionality I just addressed. So depending on, you know, class and age and ability, you will be placed in a sort of hierarchy uh, within society, which will affect your ability to access healthcare. And this will lead to differences in exposure to disease, to differences in ability to exert certain health behaviors. It will give you different access to health system and can lead to inequalities. So it is per se quite difficult, although in medicine we try to do that, to take apart the two layers of sex and gender. It's a lot of times it's not really possible because they keep influencing each other. 
So that's definitely one of the major challenges. How do you really tear these apart and which ones uh, are you investigating? The second one is really a bit about terminology. So if we look at what we've done historically, um, depending on where you look at in the world, you will find different words being used. So in the US, the focus has mostly been on sex as a biological variable. So SABV, you'll find in, in a lot of texts and the NIH also asks about inclusion of SABV. I would say it's mostly a political function because it was easier at a certain point to get especially the biomedical field on board in um, reflecting upon the impact of sex on uh, uh, diseases rather than asking people to consider gender. In Canada, historically, the focus was always on sex and gender, and their slogan is every cell has a sex and everybody has a gender. And what we talk about at the EU level, which sometimes trickles down to the national level, a lot of times not necessarily, is the gender dimension, which is a bit of a, a combination of, of different layers. I'll just I'll go back to that in a second. Um, why do we need the gender dimension? These are just excerpts from these agencies. So this is uh, the EU network and what they say was will improve the scientific quality and societal relevance of your work. The Canadians will tell you that it improves the rigor, reproducibility and generalizability of your work and the NIH say, says it increases reproducibility through rigor and transparency. So it's really not just, um, well, let's say a minor thing that uh, a tiny group of people is pursuing, but really the, the major funding agencies ask you to look at this because they assume that A, it will increase the reproducibility because it might otherwise be a factor that you simply didn't take into account, which was relevant. It will increase the excellence of your work. And most importantly, you will produce results that have a higher societal value simply because you're catering to more groups within the population. In the EU area, we have really three layers that are part of this gender dimension. So one is the gender equality in scientific careers, one is gender balance in decision making, and one is really the content layer. So there's these three that need to be addressed in one way or another. And, and what that really shows you is differently than the other agencies is that we take into con we take two layers um, uh, into account and one is the content layer, which is really the sex and gender analysis and research and innovation. And the other one is the context layer. So how does it affect careers and who is actually making decisions? So why does that matter? And that's the last two slides before we can go into the discussion. And here the challenge really is, does gender impact research? Does it actually matter? You know, is, is it something that affects or are we just all super objective and, and, and does it work? When people ask that question, I always like to refer them to this paper. And this paper was published by the late Ben Barris, who was an amazing neuroscientist who passed away a few years ago, who published, was very prolific and published in, in very high impact journals, published many seminal papers. and. Towards the end of his career, he was once asked, what was the most important paper you ever wrote? And he said this one. So I would urge you to read Ben Barris's most important paper, which tells you a lot about how gender affects academia from the perspective of researchers. And one of the quotes you'll find in here is this one, which is Ben Barris gave a great seminar today, but then his work is much better than his sister's. Well, Ben Barris never had a sister. Ben Barris was born as Barbara Barris and started her scientific career as Barbara Barris and then transitioned to becoming Ben Barris later on in his career. So he really experienced academia in the US as Barbara and as Ben Barris and tells you a lot about his personal experiences and then also gives a lot of pointers to what we could do potentially differently in the future uh, and how we could make our organizations different. Why does that matter? Well, because depending on who's doing the work, we might get more disaggregated data or not. And this is work from my colleague, Matthias Nielsen in, in uh, Denmark. He did that when he was working with Londa Schiebinger in Stanford. And what they did is they analyzed a million and a half papers published in PubMed and had a look at whether they were offering sex and gender disaggregated data. Or there was a sex and gender specific analysis. And what they saw was that depending on whether there were women on the team as first authors, as last authors, or as members of a group, the likelihood of having sex and gender specific analysis was much higher. 
So of course, we always assume we're all super objective in what we do, but of course our life experience shape the questions we're asking and shape the way we look at problems and actually shape the problems we see. So in a way, um, what the EU is telling you with looking at content and context really has an impact on the questions we are asking and also on the data we're producing. And uh, with the last publications we've had where we looked at sex and gender in clinical trials in COVID, that could not be more true. And we just saw that reproduced again on a very large scale. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm very much looking forward to, to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.